I think of uh, Bitcoin as money, and money being the market good that you acquire to save and exchange your time, your energy, your effort, your labor. And so that's what Bitcoin is, plain and simple. Um, that's a technology that all humans need, both on Wall Street and those that are at the cypherpunk manifestos in San Francisco. So it's permissionless money, so no one's allowed to tell anyone they can't use it. Bitcoin is owned by all of us, by the people. So over half of the gold supply is owned by governments and central banks. I think governments own only 4% of the Bitcoin supply. Over the years, Bitcoin has evolved from a niche digital asset to a disruptive force in global finance, challenging the dominance of traditional players like BlackRock. While mainstream institutions appear to embrace Bitcoin, insiders suspect a different agenda. Could BlackRock's interest in Bitcoin signal an impending price surge engineered behind closed doors? The asset's promise of financial freedom and resistance to manipulation threatens entrenched powers, making it a prime target for covert control attempts. In a revealing interview, Strike CEO Jack Mallers shared insights with Dylan LeClaire, explaining why Bitcoin's fixed supply is a game changer. Mallers argued that its scarcity preserves value over time, providing a hedge against the hidden forces driving inflation and economic instability. As BlackRock quietly positions itself, Mallers insists that Bitcoin's role as a decentralized, censorship-resistant asset is more vital than ever, hinting that powerful entities may soon trigger a massive price rally to suit their interests. With traditional currencies facing devaluation due to excessive printing, the demand for Bitcoin as a true store of value is escalating. However, whispers about BlackRock's involvement raise questions. Is the institution preparing to capitalize on an upcoming Bitcoin boom, potentially orchestrated by its own financial maneuvers? The transformative impact of Bitcoin on global finance seems undeniable. But the battle for control could determine who benefits most from its rise. Watch clips from the interview for more on Maller's perspective. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe, and turn on notifications for updates. Thanks for joining us again. Enjoy the video. Well, if Bitcoin is a real cost of capital. Um, the analogy that I use is kind of weird, a little dark, but whatever. Um, the analogy I've used frequently is um, the guarantee that Bitcoin has a fixed supply and you can't print anymore, to me is very similar to the guarantee of death in human life. And the reason I think that analogy is helpful is because time as an asset generally is infinite time in theory, but my time is scarce and limited. And it's the promise that I'm going to die and that I can't live forever is what allows me to value my life. If I could live forever, I'd get married in 100,000 years. I'd think about having kids in a million years. I'd go to the gym in 10 million years. I wouldn't, I wouldn't eat the, the steak and the vegetables tonight, I'd eat the donuts and the pizza, and I'd focus on that in 10 billion years if time was infinite. But time's not, and I'm gonna die, so I wanna catch sunsets, and I wanna reproduce, and I wanna be a dad, and I wanna be healthy, and I wanna be useful. And so it's that finite promise that allow, of death that allows me to value my life. Now, if you take that and bring it to money, whether it's monetary energy with sale or however you think about it, if there's infinite amounts of dollars or euros or pounds and paper, how are you supposed to value the paycheck that you get today? If they can print infinite amounts, like as if you could live forever, then nothing's valuable. And so Bitcoin as a finite promise, it actually allows me to not only value my paycheck today and the money I have now, but it's this idea of opportunity cost of should I go spend unlimited amounts of money on marketing, hire tens of thousands of employees, launch tens of thousands of products. Um, in a fiat world, sure, why not? Zero interest rates, unlimited venture capital, and it's all about top line growth, print, print, print. Um, but if you introduce the, the, the promise of you can't print any more Bitcoin, the promise of death, the way we think about it at Strike is Bitcoin averages annually 63% over the last 10 years. And so we use that metric of, is what we're going to do as a business, are we going to be able to beat 63%? Because if not, 
it's not worth it, right? We actually have something we can measure our business against, a real cost of capital, because capital isn't this thing that governments print out the wazoo that's a worthless piece of paper. Capital is actually accretive to our shareholders. It's beneficial to store on our balance sheet. Building a big capital base is actually useful. You hear Michael Saylor talk about having $500 million of cash was just a melting ice cube. But having $500 million of Bitcoin is a strong capital base you could change the world with. And so that's our approach internally, is it's a real cost of capital. We try and measure that cost of capital, whether we take the average annual return over the last decade, over the last five years, over the last one year, and we make strategic decisions. But what that's done for us is we're... Not, not nearly as big as other startups people-wise. We stay lean people-wise. We stay focused product-wise. We only build things that we know people want. We only build things that are sustainable. We operate profitably and we care deeply about that and that we think we want to be net producers for the world. We want to, in Bitcoin terms, we want to do well. We want our shareholders to outperform Bitcoin by owning strike shares. And so you got to be a net producer. You got to, you know, have sats flow, as they say. So it's changed us entirely. But I really like, you know, if a business was living as if they were never going to die, you know, the business equivalent of they'd eat donuts every day. They'd never think about relationship and being useful and meaningful and taking care of themselves, right? So like that's changed us. It's like a like meaningful life, cost of capital. Does that make sense? Mallers compared Bitcoin scarcity to the inevitability of death, emphasizing its role in giving true value to money. Unlike fiat currencies, which are endlessly printable, Bitcoin's fixed supply ensures a genuine benchmark for wealth. At Strike, Mallers uses Bitcoin's average annual growth rate of 63% to guide strategic decisions, prioritizing sustainable, customer-focused projects over speculative pursuits. He admitted underestimating the adoption speed of Bitcoin's Lightning Network initially. However, observing clients shift away from traditional finance giants like BlackRock towards Bitcoin-centric services confirmed the need to double down on regulated global Bitcoin offerings. Let's go back to the interview and watch more clips to gain insights from Jack Mallers. What I can speak to is just my transparent experience building strike i think a lot of the timing stuff for lightning and the medium of exchange piece i think i was early and i got wrong for sure you know uh, strike is my first real entrepreneurial endeavor at any scale and you know sometimes i say it's like my first real job um i did have a job before strike um debatable if it's real or not that's a different story so I give that context to say when I started Strike, I really thought the job of the founder and the CEO was to kind of predict the future. And I figured, you know, it makes a lot of sense for Lightning to disintermediate these things. And it should, in theory, play out in years, like you said, as opposed to decades or anything like that. And what I realized in building Strike is that my job is actually to just, like, shut the up and listen to customers <laughs> and just it just listen and you know the reality of what we've seen at the business is um, we're living through a giant wealth transfer right you've got pools of capital and real estate and equities and collectibles and art and gold and that money is cycling out and into Bitcoin and that's the main product that people want and what what customers wanted from us is, you know, Bitcoin is the opportunity, but BlackRock is an asset manager. Coinbase is a crypto exchange that for the life of them can't seem to focus on Bitcoin at all. Fidelity is a uh, traditional uh, brokerage service. It's like who's like focusing on Bitcoin for the world and giving financial services for this wealth transfer. And that's all customers wanted from us. And when we kind of slowed down and we just listened and we were like, oh, people want us more accessible in more markets. They want a focused, high quality Bitcoin product with amazing technology and a company that isn't focused on the exchange and the speculation, but financial services. Because what we see from customers is Bitcoin becomes more a part of your life.
Our customers usually buy shit coins on some exchange, and then eventually they get orange pilled, eventually they fully understand it, then Bitcoin doesn't become 1% of your net worth, it becomes 10, 25, 50, and you want a financial service to work with you over the next decades in transition, and that's who we've become. And so my long answer is we, I don't like to speculate on the medium of exchange stuff anymore. I've really changed to just, you know, trying to listen to customers and l let things play out with time. You know, we, we try and be licensed and regulated and available with amazing technology in as many markets as we can so that whatever customers need from us when it comes to Bitcoin, we can be there and we can do it at extreme scale with the best quality in the world. Yeah, we don't speculate on that stuff anymore. I mean, the lightning stuff for us grows, but the primary business right now is customers buying a lot of Bitcoin. Um, it's the brokerage, it's the wealth transfer. I love the Bitcoin equals technology plus fiat liquidity. And right now we're dominated in the fiat liquidity piece. We're living through really unique times of currency debasement. I think Bitcoin is the best expression of that. And if you're going to change consumer behavior at scale, People are changing at scale the way that they store money and wealth and assets a lot quicker than they're changing the way they use Apple Pay. So I don't know if that was the answer you were looking for, but that's just the truth. As the plot thickens, Bitcoin's potential boom looms larger. Speculation surrounds BlackRock's quiet accumulation, suggesting that its recent moves could be a precursor to an orchestrated price surge. If true, this would position the investment giant to dominate the market and reap enormous gains when Bitcoin's value skyrockets. The implications are significant. If BlackRock's interests align with a coming wave of institutional adoption, smaller investors could find themselves riding a tide engineered by forces far more powerful than anticipated. Jack Mallers remains adamant that Bitcoin's appeal lies in its decentralization and transparency traits that set it apart from the shadowy maneuvers often associated with legacy financial systems. However, as institutions like BlackRock ramp up their involvement, questions arise about the future of Bitcoin's autonomy. Could the very qualities that make Bitcoin revolutionary be at risk if financial behemoths assert control over the market? While the influx of institutional capital might bring legitimacy, it also raises the specter of centralization, for those seeking genuine financial sovereignty, the potential for manipulation by traditional power players like BlackRock presents a paradox. As the world's eyes turn to Bitcoin, the stakes have never been higher, and understanding who truly wields power in the market is crucial. The coming months could reveal whether Bitcoin's next chapter will be one of grassroots financial revolution, or whether the same institutions it sought to disrupt will manage to shape its destiny. Thanks for watching. Please share your thoughts in the comments below. Remember to subscribe, share this video, and hit your thumbs on the like button. See you in our next video.